Okay, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. So this is the first in our six Sunday School class series on Earth Care. And we're going to be talking about living out our faith in our role in creation care. And I'm going to count on you guys to keep me on task because I'm working from two computers. So if I'm talking about something that has nothing to do with what's on the screen, <laughs> just shout at me, okay? So I'm Katie, and I'm one uh, representative of the Earth Care team here at UPC. And we are super excited to be kicking off this Sunday School series. As part of our Earth Care pledge that our session adopted in 2019 as we became an Earth Care congregation through the Presbyterian Church, we pledged action on education and outreach. So we're trying to live into that Earth Care pledge through this Sunday School series. Some of you may remember three years ago when we had our first ever Sunday School series for Earth Care, and it wrapped up just in time as the world shut down for the pandemic. Um, so you might remember that we had a diverse group of guest speakers come in to talk to us about various topics within creation care for that Sunday School series. This time, you're gonna be hearing more from your fellow UPC members who are part of the Earth Care team We've been doing some deep dives into aspects of creation care, and we are just kind of bursting with excitement to share this material with you and talk to you about it. However, we don't want to just give you a bunch of information. Our goal is to help you find areas where you can take some action and to give you the tools to do that so we can all really make a difference. Our hope is that whether you came to all the Sunday School classes in 2020, or you just stumbled in here to have something to do for the Sunday School hour, you're going to learn something, and you're going to feel some inspiration here. Um, some housekeeping items. John is recording all of our sessions. So for our friends who can't be in the room today, we're going to make that available. Um, and also, if there are any of the upcoming classes that you can't make it to, but you want to be part of that, we'll make those available to you as well. And we'll be able to make those available by having you sign up for um, emails from us where we're going to share some resources that come up over the course of these six weeks. Are we going to put it on the website also? Or yes, okay, yes. it will also be on the website. So you can find that birth care section of the UPC website. Um, other housekeeping items I need to get to at this point? Good, okay, cool. All right, so this is a wordy slide, but I think it's important that we actually acknowledge that pledge that we made um, it, as a church, really. Um, so it states that in education, we will seek learning and teaching opportunities to know and understand the threats to God's creation and the damage already inflicted. Our outreach will encourage public policy and community involvement that protects and restores the vulnerable and degraded earth as well as oppressed and neglected people. We will seek to achieve environmental justice through coalitions and ecumenical partnerships. Those are some big words and some big statements. So we're trying to live into that, starting here with this Sunday School series and with things that spin off from this. Blessed Tomorrow is a coalition of diverse religious partners working together to advance ambitious climate solutions. It's a branch of an organization called Eco America that has a goal of building leadership, public support, and political resolve around climate solutions. Blessed Tomorrow is the branch of Eco America that works with religious institutions. So the Presbyterian Church, PCUSA, partnered with Blessed Tomorrow to make their climate ambassador training um, available and free to interested Presbyterians. Um, so I was lucky enough to be one of those interested Presbyterians and finish that in 2022. And I'm telling you this, because if you're interested, you can ask me about it. And also, some of the material that I'm going to be using today comes from Blessed Tomorrow and from Eco America. So if you see that logo pop up on some of my slides, that's where it's coming from. That's my disclosure statement. Faith communities are taking a real leadership role on climate change and climate action, and the Presbyterian Church is right there. As you all know, church isn't just what happens on Sunday morning, right? Bridget? <laughs> <laughs> um, the Office of Public Witness 
uh, is the Public Policy Information and Advocacy Office of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, and it seeks to apply biblically and theologically based insight to issues that impact the public. Also, the Presbyterian Hunger Program has a mission of alleviating hunger and eliminating its causes, and the Earth Care Conservation Program is housed under the Presbyterian Hunger Program. And I'm telling you all of this because when I discovered all this richness within our church and all of the action that's taken um, in the name of the Presbyterian Church, I think it really helped strengthen my faith because I learned how our church here in the greater church not only stands for but really takes action on issues that really matter to me. And when it comes to creation care, I know I'm in good company in this room and feeling a deep sense of gratitude for the wonder and beauty of nature and God's creation. If we think of the created world as a reflection of God's glory, it's important that we express our gratitude by fulfilling our responsibility to be good stewards of this creation. While some may see climate change as a political, economic, or a scientific issue, we first and foremost see climate change and action on it as a moral issue. All right, you heard Barry talk up already. As a folks in this room, I am not the biblical scholar here, not by a long shot, but I am aware of multiple points in the Bible in which we're tasked with tilling and keeping God's garden, where we're called as stewards of the mysteries of God, and where we're told to learn from and listen to the plants and animals of creation. There is biblical grounding for creation care. And beyond that, we are called to do for the least of these in our following of Jesus. We all have noticed that our world is changing. Flowers bloom earlier, the coastlines are shifting, weather patterns are more extreme, our climate is becoming less stable, and our neighbors are suffering near and far. <clears throat> so who are we talking about when we're thinking about the least of these in terms of climate action? For the most part, it's those who contributed the least to climate change who are most impacted by the effects of climate change, by the floods, the droughts, the fires, the hunger, and the dislocation. So those who contributed the least fossil fuel emissions, the least consumerism, the least accumulation culture, um, those are the ones who are most impacted by these changes. And for the most part, they're the least resilient in the face of these changes. They have fewer resources for rebuilding and for relocating if that's necessary. I'm gonna bring your attention to the top map here. The, this map shows where the greatest emissions come from that cause and increase climate change. The red and orange kind of color shows higher levels of carbon dioxide emissions. And I will tell you this map is about 10 years old, so I think that like India and China would be a lot brighter now than it was in 2011. And then the lower map is showing vulnerability to climate change. So here are kind of the red and orange is the more vulnerable places in the world. So you can see in large part, they're kind of inverse of one another. All right, we know our country was bright red on that top map. Do we care about what's happening? You might be surprised to know that it turns out most Americans are more concerned than you might think. Eco America's research on this shows that 75% of Americans are concerned about climate. And with 45% being very concerned, and then if you add in the people who are a little concerned, that goes up to about 90% of Americans who are concerned. I don't know if you're surprised by this, but I was surprised by this. I thought there were a lot more climate deniers out there. Um, so to hear that 90% of Americans are concerned, um, that's kind of exciting to me because that means there's room for action and people might want to take action. So, but despite the high level of concern, only 51% of Americans believe that others around them are concerned. So importantly, more than three times as many people are very concerned than we believe to be the case. So what this means in practice is that Americans who are concerned about climate change <laughs> feel very alone in that concern, right? And we're here today to create 
community around our concern so we can talk about it and we can discover what we can do about it. And we should acknowledge that each of us in this room may be coming here from a different perspective and with a distinct level of readiness for change. Please be assured that every person in this room or anybody watching it on the screen belongs here and that we want you here and we're all together in this. Also, as we present a myriad of action points over the next several weeks, we hope that each of you finds something that fits for you. But if something doesn't resonate, no worries, right? just let it go. The beauty of having these discussions here at church is that we're coming at this material with a common grounding in our faith and with a baseline level of love for one another as members of this family, church family. So today's class is really an invitation to explore and to learn and to grow together today and through this Sunday School series. We're going to talk about some things that might increase our individual or collective anxiety, but most importantly, our goal is to discuss what gives us hope, because we want to see that hope and the action that it drives multiplied among us. So first, let's talk about how climate change came to be, how it's impacting people, our society, and our natural world. So global warming pollution is caused primarily by people burning fossil fuels for heat and energy. When we burn fossil fuels, petroleum, coal, natural gas, it produces greenhouse gas emissions, largely carbon dioxide. When the carbon dioxide goes up into our atmosphere, it essentially thickens the atmosphere, making it like a thermal blanket that traps heat in so that our planet gets warmer. So in the United States, that's the large white percentages on this slide, there are five major contributors to this pollution. Transportation is responsible for the largest share, 29%, so that's burning fossil fuels for our cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships. Electricity production is a very close second at 28%, and while we've been moving to renewable energy and made a lot of movement on that in the last 10 years, Still more than 60% of our energy production in the United States comes from these fossil fuel burning uh, technologies. So if you looked at this material 10 years ago, energy from renewable sources was only at about 1%. In 2022, it's about 13%. So we are making progress. It would be nice if we could expedite that progress a little bit. Oh, I also want to highlight for you, if you look at the smaller percentages, that's looking at globally the contributors to climate change. So you'll see that there's a shift toward agriculture globally being more like a quarter of the contributions to greenhouse gas emissions, where transportation takes up a much smaller share um, in the global, in the whole world. And is it because internationally there's more that they're not as car dependent as we are in this country? I don't know for sure, Dan, but I think so. Um, I would guess so. I think probably the Western world in general has a higher transportation component, mm -hmm. but then when you factor in everything and then agriculture is kind of everywhere, yeah. um, that's probably why. All right, the primary result of our carbon pollution is that the Earth is getting warmer. So this animation from NASA, you may have seen it, this is such a great animation that it comes up a lot in climate change discussions. You may have seen this before. It illustrates how our planet has warmed since 1880, about when we started burning fossil fuels at scale. It warms slowly at first, but then as we burn more and more, it starts speeding up. Notice the dates, too, at the top of the video as it plays here. So 2011 to 2021 was the warmest decade, oh, I'm just gonna run, uh, was the warmest decade on record. 
and it's the human activities, as we've discussed, that has, have caused and escalated this warming. All right. The graph on the left shows our exponential increase in emissions since 1920 from burning solid, liquid, and gas fossil fuels. The graph then on the right shows the increase in planetary temperatures over the past century plus. You'll notice that the temperature change seems to really take off somewhere around 1980. And it's a little busy because it's drawn from multiple sources. So some of these are kind of the top sources for this information, um, NASA, NOAA, Berkeley Earth. Um, so they're kind of all represented there. And they follow the same basic trajectory. So those warmer temperatures are causing more frequent and more intense disasters, more and larger wildfires, floods, storms, and droughts. Yeah, Toby. The one over on the left yeah. dropped severely. COVID-19. COVID. Isn't that interesting? You remember the pictures of like the, the sky over Dubai mm -hmm. during the pandemic? It was like so beautiful, <laughs> which is not normally like that. So there was there was an amazing drop. I mean, it's a global pandemic. Everyone was affected, right? But that has since popped right back up. It's not represented on this graph. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't really learn a lesson with that. So we know what's driving our problem, burning the fossil fuels in these areas. Now let's look at the impacts. So this is a snapshot of 2021 in the United States, looking at the billion dollar climate or weather and weather disasters, meaning disasters that cost a billion dollars or more. So from 1980 to 2021, we averaged seven to seven and a half billion dollar disaster events per year. The annual average for the most recent five years is 17. So you can see that that's really accelerating. In 2020, we had 22 disaster events. Um, yeah, 2021 was 20. So where are climate change um, disasters impacting us? So you can see the storms, the hurricanes kind of in the southeast and the south. Um, and then, and those events, so we're kind of talking about things here. Those events are things that last a day, maybe two or three. So then if we think about the points in the west, um, so those fires, the wildfires out in the west, those are burning over months to years, um, weeks to months, sorry, um, and burning forests and towns over many millions of acres. However, the drought is what I was getting at that lasts months to years. Um, and those droughts in the Southwest are setting new records for duration and damages. So overall, all of these things have massive economic impacts from damage to property and property values, loss of infrastructure and lost jobs, not to mention the mental health impacts on the people who are affected. So as people of faith, we're motivated to act on all sorts of issues because of our love for God, our love for our neighbors, and all of God's creation. For the longest time, I thought caring about the environment was important because we needed to preserve God's beautiful creation. So if you can, it's pretty light, but if you can see that's a picture of Pisgah National Forest. That's one of my favorite places in North Carolina. And this is important, just focusing on creation. However, when I started to understand more about the inequities in climate change impacts, I really discovered how profoundly climate change, climate action, aligns us with the values of Jesus. So let's talk about that. Climate change is a global phenomenon that affects every one of these concerns. If you care about people having access to safe drinking water, having enough healthy food to eat, if you're worried about refugees and other migrants, if you're concerned about increasing violence and war, you care about climate change. I'm gonna highlight a few of these and try to make the connection between climate change and how they re re um, <coughs> relate to these issues. So we know climate change has far-reaching effects. It affects all of us, 
but some more than others. So water and access to clean water, migration in the face of climate disasters, and lack of access to resources, agriculture and food systems, poverty, violence or peace, and then racial inequity. So climate change is really an issue of justice. Let's talk about it more. All right, we're gonna talk about food and agriculture in the next class, but for our purposes today, let's think about how faith communities have a rich tradition of trying to make sure hungry people get food, right? Our efforts on this can be challenged as we respond to climate change and climate-related disasters. Climate change can disrupt growing practices, food transport systems, and threaten the overall security of our food system. Also, the prevalence of undernourished people tends to be higher in countries and places that are more highly exposed to climate extremes and climate disasters. Water, think about it, right? Sometimes we have way too much and there's flooding and sometimes we simply don't have enough and there's drought and higher wildfire risk. Also, this affects food production, access to clean water, loss of homes, businesses, infrastructure, and in some areas, increases migration and conflict. Poverty. So we know that climate change exacerbates income inequality. If you think about it, those who can recover will, um, and those who don't, don't have the means to recover, are gonna suffer the consequences of relocation, loss of property, loss of employment, again, with mental health impacts. Resiliency is really income dependent, and it's unfair and makes climate change an issue of justice. Now, racial equity, we're gonna talk about environmental justice in the fourth class, I believe. Um, so the, the bottom line here is that existing inequalities are intensified um, by a changing climate. So if we think about air quality, for example, who lives in closest proximity to and suffers the health impacts from landfills, industrial facilities, power plants, close to highways. It creates an unjust burden for communities of color and low-income communities. So again, it makes climate change an issue of justice. Let me give you an example. So this is data from the Department of Health and Human Services. One in two Latinos in the United States live in counties that frequently violate air quality standards due to the combustion of fossil fuels. Hispanics are 60% more likely to visit a hospital due to asthma compared to non-Hispanic whites. That's huge. And this is the most mind-blowing one. Hispanic children are twice as likely to die from asthma as compared to their non-Hispanic white counterparts. If this isn't an issue of justice, I don't know what is. Migration. Tens of thousands of people left New Orleans, either temporarily or permanently, following Hurricane Katrina. You probably know them. We have friends and neighbors who are now living in North Carolina who are from New Orleans. That's just one example of migration happening as a result of um, climate impacts. Worldwide, there are so many more examples. If you are interested in this topic, there's a great documentary that came out 10 or 15 years ago called Climate Refugees. Um, and it won tons of awards. It's really well done. And then conflict. What does increased migration and scarcity of resources lead to? Competition for resources and jobs can lead to violence. Formerly separate groups being brought together can lead to cultural tensions. And reports suggest um, from the UN Development Program that the civil war in South Sudan is at least partially attributable to climate change because of extreme weather conditions and competition for resources. 
there's a great, um, it's actually considered juvenile fiction um, called Long Walk to Water. I don't know if anybody's seen that. Um, that's a great kind of intimate view of the war in Sudan. If you want to see it, I actually brought it today. <laughs> These same issues affect people closer to home. So flooding near the coast, here's an image after Hurricane Florence in downtown Wilmington. Sea level rise and shifting coastlines are affecting beach communities and more inland, variable rainfall and extreme heat for farmers and agricultural communities. So we've talked about some of these like very weighty things. Let's start talking about solutions. Um, when we talk about solving climate change, we have two basic problems we need to address. We're burning a lot of fossil fuels for heat and energy, and we're also destroying nature, the forests, grasslands, waters that sustain us. But there are solutions to address each of these points. And the climate solutions are here today we have the technology, the ideas, and the systems in place to help address climate change. We just need public support, all of us, and the political resolve in order to do it. And we can. We can electrify. We can move to clean, renewable energy. We can restore thriving nature around us. We can update our agricultural and food consumption practices in ways that heal the land. So the goal of this Sunday School series is to help us all identify that step or those steps that we as individuals and in community can take toward positive change. We're going to look at some of these on kind of a broader scale because we're going to break this down further in the subsequent classes over the Sunday School series. Some people might think that wasting less energy, using clean energy and restoring nature are nice but aren't really feasible or too expensive. Five or 10 years ago, they might have been right. We had to subsidize wind and solar power because renewable energy sources were costing much more than fossil fuels. But check out this graph on the left. Today, the opposite is true. It shows that wind and solar, the costs have declined so much that they're now the cheapest sources of energy, which is pretty cool. In addition to being clean and renewable, um, these produce little or no waste, create new good paying jobs, and generate savings that communities can then spend on other priorities like housing, education, health, safety, recreation. You'll remember that transportation in America was the largest contributor to our greenhouse gas emissions. So more efficient transportation may be the most effective way to mitigate or stop climate change. Cities and towns are working to improve public transit and to improve the safety and access for people who are using active transit, transport like biking and walking. The purchase and use of electric vehicles are experiencing, expo experiencing an exponential growth, while traditional internal combustion engines are facing terminal decline. Um, most of the biggest Car manufacturers in the world have announced that they're going to stop making fossil fuel cars by 2030. That's right around the corner. Electric bikes and scooters are all the rage in cities and on campuses. UP, I always want to say UPC, UPS, Amazon, and FedEx have ordered hundreds of thousands of clean delivery vehicles that will save them money while putting less pollution out into our atmosphere, which is pretty cool. And if you haven't already made the leap, there's probably an electric car in your future, whether you like it or not, <laughs> and the sooner the better. The second branch of our solution scheme is about restoring nature. So natural climate solutions help us reduce pollution and even begin to take carbon out of the atmosphere. So nature can serve as a carbon sink, meaning we're taking the carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into the plants and into the soil so that there's less out there, not just not putting more out. So that's pretty awesome, I think. So we can and we need to protect existing forests and grasslands and waters and work to heal those that we've damaged or destroyed. Um, talk more about this next week, but improve our agricultural practices and stop degrading our soil and water from the way that we practice agriculture. 
And protecting and restoring nature is something that all of us can do. We're going to talk about an opportunity you all have in two weeks to do that coming up. And we really need to advocate for it with our policymakers. This is one of the big takeaways that I think you're going to hear over and over in the next six classes is that advocating with our policymakers is really critical to making significant change. So we need to support any measures that preserve or restore lands and waters. And that is John Wilson's little baby that he's going to talk about in week three. <laughs> The other huge benefit to protecting and restoring nature is that it really helps with climate change. So that's that drawing the carbon out of the atmosphere. As this chart shows you, in the United States, nature has the potential to remove more than 20% of our carbon pollution. Um, that's equivalent to removing emissions from all cars and trucks currently on the road. So there are other benefits too, of course. Restoring forests, enhancing biodiversity, restoring habitat, protects against soil erosion, and makes our air cleaner and purer. And I think this is true for most of us. We're happier and less stressed when we spend time in nature. I don't know how I would have gotten through the pandemic without being able to walk through local forests and get my hands down in the dirt in the garden. And I've heard that from a lot of people around here. So this is good for us, and it's good for our neighbors. The spirit with which we approach climate solutions matters too. We need to keep in mind the importance of justice in climate work. The wealthiest people aren't the folks living right next to polluting power plants and highways, and it's generally lower income people and communities who do. It's not right and it's not fair that they and their children suffer the health consequences of this. Things that are, this pollution is generated for all of our benefits. So we need to make sure that each American has the same access to clean air and water and thriving nature. Second, ambition. So historically, we've set some halfway steps and goals that then we failed to achieve. So we need to set goals that will quickly stop and then reverse climate change and pass laws and provide incentives to make sure that they happen within years and not decades. So this is important on large scale and also for us as individuals, it's not taking the path of least resistance that usually leads to the greatest reward. And the third is climate restoration, what we were just talking about. Nature has always supported human well-being, and each of us can be part of the solution set, um, make it part of our daily lives and advocate for it in our communities. With these concepts driving us, what can we do as a congregation and as individuals of faith First, we need to be good stewards of God's gifts and God's provisions, and that means using the resources that we have wisely and practicing gratitude. It seems like a small thing, but it can have large impacts. We'll talk about solutions in this area for the next several weeks, sustainability in soil and food, energy solutions, local actions we can support in others. We also, in this work, need to remember to care for our neighbors. We need to prepare and adapt to ensure that there are safe places to live, work, and play for everyone. And we need to bear witness to the world of how creation suffers and call others to act for a safe, healthy, and a just world for all. And I keep saying, we're going to talk about this later, we're going to talk about this later. This is the call for you all to bear witness. We know that people are concerned. You saw the data from Eco America. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about it with our friends and in our community, and let's work together on it. We can bear witness to these climate impacts when we talk to friends and family, neighbors, community, and most importantly, with policymakers who can make policy level changes that we need to reach our goals. Climate advocacy spans a whole spectrum of activities. So think about as we move through these classes, where it fits for you, where you feel comfortable jumping in, knowing that a little bit of discomfort and then doing something can make you feel really good. Also, organizations like the Presbyterian Church and Interfaith Power and Light make advocacy with policymakers super easy. And we're going to show you how to do that once you get on their email list. They send out these little emails like, action alert, action alert. 
you sign in, they've already pre-populated your stuff and have a nice spiel that you can edit or not and send it out to your policymakers. It's pretty awesome. Another important step is to join <laughs> and support like-minded organizations locally and nationally. For me, it's Interfaith Power and Light, the Nature Conservancy, and locally the Triangle Land Conservancy. And I know those of you in here could probably slap a bunch more things up here. Um, and if any time you want to share, please do. And now I'll highlight some of the immediate actions that you can take. In the spirit of being good stewards, you're invited to the Bowling Creek cleanup in two weeks. So it's Saturday the 18th in the morning, and this is put together by the Orange Chatham Interfaith Care for Creation. So people coming from all different faith groups in Orange and Chatham counties coming together to do some cleanup along Bowling Creek, starting a meeting at the Chapel Hill Community Center Park, just down the road, um, and we're gonna work all the way up to Umstead Park. Um, anything else you want me to hit on that? Only that I have promised my fellow Orange Chatham Interfaith Care for Creation Steering Committee members at Binkley Baptist and Chapel de Cross and Kahila Synagogue that I'm going to deliver many Presbyterians <laughs> from UPC at that event. Please, don't make Donald please don't make me look like a lion fool. It's going to be great. It, it really is going to be great. And, um, and we're going to meet at 10 a.m. at the community park, as Katie said, for a very few minutes of inspiration and instruction. And then we're going to split into two groups, one that works one way on the stream um, from Umstead Park and the other that works the other way from the community park. And to mention that this is part of a larger Haw River cleanup a -thon. So it's not even just the Orange Chatham Creation Care group that's doing this, but pretty cool that Bowling Creek is part of the Haw River watershed, so it fits right in with that kind of greater cleanup that's happening. Um, and they did mention, um, in, in case you don't feel like looking all this up, you just want to show up at 10 a.m. that day, bring your gloves, but they'll have the bags, um, so you don't have to bring your own garbage bags, um, and just be ready to work. Yeah, 33rd and consecutive year for the Haw River clean up a thon and the statistics about the amount of trash that they've cleaned out of the Hall River watershed are wonderful and I think this year it's going to really jump because hopefully people will be feeling safer about being out there. Yeah. Did you have to just bring your kids and grandchildren? Yeah. Yeah, this is very kid friendly. And while we're out there we're also going to be checking out a lot, a lot of the invasives and learning about the invasive plants and a subsequent effort will most likely be organized to go back and yank out um, a lot of those invasives that are along Bowling Creek and you know everywhere, as I'm sure you all know better than I do. Thank you, John. Also, there is this um, great document uh, prepared by Presbyterian Mission um, for following during Lent to kind of take your Lenten practice up a notch and to make it focus on earth care. Um, this resource, I think it's already on our website, yeah, or you can even search for it, Google it. Oh, yeah, it's on our website right there. Mm -hmm. So the upcoming classes, hopefully we've got your advocacy juices flowing this morning a little bit, and you might consider coming back next week when we're going to talk about sustainable diet and regenerative agriculture, and also da -da -da -da, celebrate our first ever vegetarian second Sunday lunch. Um, following that, the following week is going to be North Carolina Earth Care Issues and Advocacy, so acting locally and opportunities to do so, then sustainable energy, environmental justice, and then we're going to do kind of a summation class on April 16th, really focusing on all the action points that we've pulled out for you over the course of the series. All right, so there's that. I wondered if Lynn or Ashley wanted to say anything about the second Sunday lunch. They've been really instrumental in getting this going. Oh, it's going to be great. Cindy Marcina and her husband are going to be our chefs at the pasta bar for the kids. So we're going to make the kids happy with things not new. Uh, so um, just really, really excited. So, um, 
um, additionally, if, if you have a wonderful vegetarian recipe, I think all of us are eager to learn more diverse ways to incorporate um, that into our diet. So Ashley's collecting recipes. So send um, send to her via email and, and we will share the proof. Awesome. And I'm just saying, there's so much talk about all these different diets. You've got like ovo, lacto, vegan, vegetarian. If you're confused at all, vegetarian just means no meat. You can still use your eggs and use your cheese if you want. We thought going vegan was a little too much for most people, so we went vegetarian. <laughs> um, but I'm excited about that. I think it's going to be delicious, first of all, and a lot of fun. And I think it's a great opportunity for you all to be our ambassadors, knowing that people are concerned about climate. Like, let's talk about why we're doing it this way, why the second Sunday lunch is going vegetarian. And if you don't know specifics on that, come to Sunday school first, and we'll tell you why that's important, and then you can carry that through. So if you haven't already, you might enjoy and benefit from watching the documentary Kiss the Ground. Has anybody seen that already? It is so good. Um, but that might give you a better understanding and a grounding for coming into next week's Sunday school class. Um, it talks about the role of agriculture and climate change, both as a source of pollution and as a potential solution. Um, so on Netflix, you can access the 90 minute version, which is the full version, but we also were able to get the 45 minute educational version, which we will make available on the website. Yes. Right now. Yes, um, and I think you're going to have a slide in a minute that shows the Earth Care webpage on UPC's website. You, you, I think you do, um, but it's, it's upcch.org slash earthcare. And um, the link to um, both the Netflix version and the 45-minute school version are both on that um, webpage. And if you have any issues finding it, just email Katie or me or Ashley, and um, we'll connect you with it. But it's great. It is great. Isn't it awesome to have a tech expert on your team? <laughs> <laughs> this is not my, that's not my bag. Yeah, but you found the 45-minute school version. I did. It was so easy. I thought I was going to have to jump through some hoops to access this. So you just kind of say who you are, why you want it, and they immediately email you the link to it with like a little password. Which, and the password is schools. <laughs> um, but I thought it would be um, fun and interesting to see the trailer for it. Um, I'm going to make it big. There's so much bad news about our planet. Um, hey, we also yeah. Sorry. The, sure. uh, the remote volume. The tech the guy room. just wants to show up here. No, the sound bar goes to sleep and doesn't communicate with a um, <laughs> church's laptop. And so you have to tell it to reconnect. There's so much bad news about our planet, and so we're Truth is, I've given up. This is the story of a simple solution, a way to heal our planet. The solution's right under our feet, and this is all this dirt. All of our soils that are under chemical conventional agriculture are almost completely devoid of microorganisms. Modern agriculture was not designed for the betterment of the soil. Fossil fuels are by no means the only thing that is causing climate change. When we damage soils, carbon goes back to the atmosphere. And when we destroy soil, it releases carbon dioxide. Biosequestration is using plants, trees, and techniques of grazing and farming to capture carbon and store it in the soil. We can fix a lot of our climate issues to be bring the CO2 down into a living plant and put it back into the soil at the moment. Plants working with soil microorganisms, it seems too simple. Healthy soils lead to a healthy plant. Healthy plant, healthy human, healthy climate. There could be way to eat food that heals the planet. The problem isn't the animal. The problem is where the animals are at. How do we take waste and repurpose and reuse it because it's really not waste? The poop has to stay in the loop. Compost is just one of the suite of soil-based carbon capture solutions. 
We know how to do it. And if we continue to scale over 30 years, we can reverse global warming. We can get the Earth back to the Garden of Eden that it once was by regeneration. To see biodiversity return to places completely devastated, that gives me hope. Our health and the health of our planet are connected. If you look over here, my neighbor's land that has been chemical fallow, and then you look over at our paddock, you have a diversity of different plant species. Which model do you want your food to be produced from? The answer is pretty simple to me. I'll make you a deal. I won't give up, and neither should you. It is so good that we actually debated about whether to devote an entire class to showing the 45-minute schools version, um, but we decided that it would be better to encourage you all in the next week, if at all possible, to at least watch the 45-minute schools version, if not the 90-minute full version, and that way we can devote much, all, most of the next class to actual discussion and additional information. And also the study guide materials, the um, resource materials that come with this documentary are extraordinary. They are really, really great. Yeah, so you can tell we're excited about it. Um, some of the stuff that was referenced in the trailer um, and that's cited in that documentary also, um, we saw Paul Hawkins, who's the editor um, of Drawdown. If you haven't seen this, I um, I took this out from the library and I kept it so long they they demanded I bring it back and then I returned it and then the next day took it back out and then also decided maybe I should just go and buy it. Um, but it is the most inspiring book I think about climate change because it presents these drawdown possibilities. Drawdown meaning ways that we can pull the carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere and actually not just stop putting it out there, but start taking it back and change the trajectory of the warming of our planet. So it presents the 100 um, most beneficial ways that we can do that, and so many of them are around agriculture, farming, soil, compost, all that stuff um, that we're gonna talk about next week. So if anybody wants to look at that, I brought it with me. <coughs> Um, and I know that not everybody is moved by charts and graphs, so that's why we've been kind of, I'm trying to bookend our classes with some fun music. Um, but I won't start this yet, because if we want to have a little discussion or Q&A or thoughts people want to share, or other resources anybody wants to bring to the fore, um, let's do that now, we have some time. Yeah, thanks. Or I can just play the music. <laughs> yeah. So during the pandemic, my daughter went vegan. Yeah. So we stopped doing butter and we did the plant-based stuff, but then it was palm oil, and then I watched one of these things that was like, oh my gosh, palm is destroying the rainforest. So <laughs> yeah. what other kinds of things are there like that where you, like, you make a false start? Like you hear something, and you go, oh, this is the answer, and then you realize, oh wait, no, this is making it worse. I kind of lost hope a little bit. Yeah. So I'm kind of micro. I think it's hard. I think the overall move toward vegan eating is, get, is better. Um, so like, yeah, maybe you're having a little bit of palm oil, but sometimes you have to kind of weigh the benefits and, and benefits, right? But like, but like what do you find your best? Earth balance. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so if you think, so anytime you think about like an environmental impact statement of like something that's, they're gonna build something, there's always, or even like environmental actions that people wanna take, there's often like, in general, this is a good thing, but then there's also these other negative consequences to other parts of the environment. It's really hard to balance that all out. So you kind of... Um, and it's so discouraging when you think you're doing something wonderful and then you find out, oh no, it's... Right. Or then you hear like the batteries for hybrid cars right. or electric cars are worse for the environment. And I don't know if that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mine is lithium is terrible. Yeah. Right, I think it's, it's leaching out. The bottom line on that stuff, for me, what I've gotten from all of the listening and reading and stuff that I've done is that as an individual, the biggest things that I can do are get an electric vehicle, compost, and eat vegan, and then on top of that, communicating with policymakers and communicating with others, the bear witness piece, um, so that we spread the word. 
So those those three kind of action points beyond the bearing witness and communicating with policymakers, those are the big three. That's a little bit about that next week too. Yeah. The the things you're talking about, electric cars and part require the generation of electricity and the, the environmental impact and the justice issues of the manu of mining and manufacture of those products are, are like she said, you know, it, it's not all a, a clean line. There's a lot of right. justice costs to the poor mm -hmm. in the poor areas of our country that are going to be greatly impacted by the less attempt to do these things. Isn't that right? Absolutely. I mean, there, there is a, you have to kind of find the balance that works kind of in the favor of what you stand for, right? And the, the, the majority of it, the, the main impact, the greater impact kind of represents your values, right? Just so we're all gonna have some environmental footprint, right? Like, even if I'm eating all plants and all whole plants and not, none of it's processed by anything, like some of the agriculture might produce greenhouse it gases, right? Or you. what's that? It still had to get to you. It still had to get to me, right? Like I'm not growing it all in my backyard. Um, so we, we're all gonna have some sort of imprint, but it's trying to minimize that imprint, right? Yeah, so we. A lot of compromise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's usually a good thing, right? <laughs> regenerative agriculture and that's uh you know and it is really important to talk to uh our policy makers but another big area that that makes maybe even a greater impact is contacting companies like if if you see an electric ups truck write ups and tell them you really like that because companies work via consumers and uh, and that can be a really positive feedback loop because companies are going to go with what people want and if we let them know what we want it's they're more likely to do it yeah and i like to praising them when they're making good decisions yes. right not just complaining about bad stuff right i probably get a lot of those complete letters and many fewer of those You'll hear Accolades. back from them. You'd be yeah. surprised. Mm -hmm. You know, right, right, right. Walmart, right. You know, so and and you, yeah, they're excited to hear from you. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool. I think Mary Ellen's the best letter writer I've ever encountered. <laughs> <laughs> I'll follow up briefly on that to say there, I I feel the pressure of like, what do we do if we take this action? There's some behind the door thing that we didn't think about about it, and I I think that's a hard point. I find that. Like when, I, when I'm working with college students on these issues, they're often like, you know, what my little thing versus the corporate world, blah, 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 which I think is fair, right? Like I'm gonna compost however the entire company of fill in the blank is doing this on a huge scale. What do we do? And I, most of the time what I say is like, actually every time you spend a dollar, you are voting for something. And so like the way you invest your money, whether whatever, puts you in the boardrooms of all the most important companies who have the biggest impact. So like your the way you choose to consume, like try to try to not consume. But when we're all gonna like buy clothes and food and whatever. And so like every time we spend money, somebody in that corporate world is tracking that. And that gets us a voice at the like CEO's boardroom table when they're making decisions. And I just I think to me, there's a lot of like, we can do, like there's grassroots, like we have a voice here. And I think it's very easy to be discouraged, but it, we do have a voice. Like we're, things are shifting because we're, like people are taking action. And companies are listening, right? Like how much, like the idea of being green was not a concept not that long ago. And now, I mean, I know it gets complicated because of greenwashing and all this, but like at least people or companies are thinking about it. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, it's hard to know, but we can do it. <laughs> and holding on to the hope, right? Like, yeah, that's I think so that's important, important and not getting bogged down with the like, ugh. Us right? versus, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, hopefully. Uh, so we live in a little 20 house neighborhood and uh, about a week ago our two grandsons are in a 79 language. So two other neighborhood kids came on, came over and said, get your boots, get, we're going on a mission. And they, they traversed the entire course of this little creek that runs through our, the whole thing, picking up trashes. They found footballs and basketballs and soccer balls and trash and stuff. And so to see that, you know, and yeah. I, I, Really Ooh, we need them for Bowling Creek. <laughs> yeah, right now, March 18th. Right so, um, soccer game. Yeah. My kids are like, I'll find out. I don't know if I want to get wet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's true. And I, I think a lot of times we have had me like, oh, the next generation, the next generation, right? And I feel like in doing this stuff and like presenting this, I want to show the next generation that like we care and we know we screwed up. And we want to do what we can to try to fix what we did. Um, and maybe not everyone is doing it, but gosh darn it, I'm not going to just like hide under the blanket and be like, oh, we messed up, it's over, you know? Um, so try, try to make a little wave, right? Maybe it can become a bigger wave. Um, so the two most common things, I think, that happen when people take action regarding earth care, like composting or recycling. The best case scenario is that that becomes kind of the gateway drug. Like, I love this. I'm going to start contacting my elected officials and trying to, trying to do the most important thing, which is change things on a policy, national, international level. Unfortunately, there's a flip side to that. A ton of people are doing the right thing about recycling and or composting. And they think, I'm doing my part. I'm all in, you know, battling climate change here. Please don't be the latter, and I know none of you are, but, but please encourage others. If you ask the average American, what can we do to combat climate change? Unfortunately, the answer still is recycle more. And that ain't it. Um, so that's, um, that's one thing. And then another thing, as, as Barry was talking about, sending that message with our actions, I'm reminded of something that I'm probably gonna show once again, at least a little excerpt, and that's one of my heroes, Bill McKibben, talking about when he went back to his church, his Methodist church in New Hampshire, the day they climbed up on the church roof and hammered in solar panels. Is that gonna change climate change on a global scale? No, but boy does that send a powerful message to elected officials that if we can climb up on this church roof and hammer in solar panels, you can climb out onto that Senate floor and hammer out a carbon bill. It sends such a strong message. Um, so. And I'll be honest, my first phone call to a policymaker, I called David Price, who I already knew it was like on my side, but it was so energizing. I had a great conversation with someone in his office and it was a lot of fun. I was like, all right, that was good. And <laughs> I, I need to talk to other people too. What, what he's talking about, you know, you might be doing something, but there's adverse things. I, I wonder if there is a major debate about whether electric cars, entirely electric cars, are a bad choice for us. When you consider the amount of money that it takes to restructure our infrastructure to support it, when you uh, think about the justice and environmental impact of all the stuff that it takes to support the, the building of them and, and the, the maintenance of them with the power companies. And it, it, there's a lot of environmental savings by using hybrids and investing all that capital instead in taking care of some of these other needs that you have. Right. That electric cars may be the worst solution that we have. Well, especially if our electricity grid is still being fueled well, by fossil fuels. Look at the cost fuels, right? it takes to change that grid and mm -hmm. put out that supply chain. Yeah, I'm going to bump that to Mary Ellen and John. I'm going to pass on these things instead of just, you know, running off real quick and looking. I think we made a lot of mistakes in our history. Running off on the extreme of some of these things without thinking them through. It's true. It's true. Well, I mean, like, that's like our whole culture, right? We've done so much without thinking things through. Um, 
of being very like singularly focused. And for the longest, I mean, it's been about a dollar, right? Um, I, I think this is, I put this kind of in lots of things in this whole area where do your own research and make your own decision. Get all the information you can, and you know, some of us might decide electric cars are good, some people might decide that's not the right thing we should be doing, but that's okay. You can do what you can, do your own research, and make your own decision. I think that's a, a good way to look at this whole topic. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to become vegan, sorry. I'm yeah, not, no, I'm not. See, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have to apologize. I, 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 will, I will try to reduce my you know, carbon footprint, but yeah. you know, it's, it's different for everybody. You know, do your research, make your own. Right. And that's, thank you so much for saying that. Because that's exactly what I mean. I don't want anybody to ever feel like, gosh, I can't believe she's talking about going vegan. That's so ridiculous, right? Like, I'm going to talk about it, but I'm going to also talk about, you know, that's not what you want to do. Let's talk about, what, like, little steps that you can take in that direction that also make a difference, right? Like, we don't all have to go to total extremes in every way. Um, one, one cho the choice that's right for me isn't necessarily the big step that you want to take for you. <laughs> um, <laughs>